welcome to another edition of the Gaming Careers Podcast, the resource for people looking to find their fit in the gaming industry. On this show, you will hear game industry professionals talk about how they succeed in today's competitive environment and how you can do the same. I'm Steve Rodusky, your host, and thanks again for joining me. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another edition of the podcast. Today, I've invited a very special guest back onto the show. I have Mark Mencher, the CEO of GameRecruiter.com and accomplished game career writer. I had such a great response uh, from you guys about Mark's last episode. I wanted to have him back on the show to share more of his experience. Mark, thanks so much for being with us again on the show. No problem, Stephen. Always enjoy it. Excellent. So uh, today we're going to talk about uh, how to break into the video game industry and really talk about the uh, the dreaded catch twenty two about getting a job. So what is this about? Well, you know, the catch twenty two, especially in the video game industry, is that to get a job you need experience, and of course, to have experience you need a job. So there's the catch twenty two right there in a nutshell. Okay. Uh, and certainly. And certainly in our industry, when we were much younger uh, and we were way more console-focused than we are today, uh, that was even a more of a challenge than, than it is today because, of course, uh, you couldn't uh, learn how to uh, code on a PlayStation dev, dev uh, station unless you had a license with Sony to to make PlayStation games or a license with Microsoft to make Xbox. So those... Uh, those platforms were really hidden, and a lot of people who wanted into the game space uh, couldn't get practice on uh, on the platform, and therefore couldn't apply for jobs. Okay, so is is that still a problem today, or are there ways around uh, that sort of barrier? Well, you know, I still hear that from many candidates who come to me uh, who are trying to uh, transition. Uh, into the industry, break in for their first job, um, you know, because of course, uh, every job order you read, uh, or, or anyone you talk to wants prior game industry experience. They want several years experience with some of the software, um, because, you know, these days people really want to hire people who can, uh, be, uh, be up and running within a few days of joining the company and not have to go through, you know, a month or two of training. Uh, right. you know, those days are gone. So, you know, people really expect, uh, the folks Folks they hire to be ready to rock and roll, so uh, so that of course so the catch twenty two still exists in in some ways uh, because of course every job ad is requiring years of experience and as a newbie you're not going to have those years of experience. Okay, so you know when I started off looking to uh, kind of break into the gaming industry, I hit a brick wall uh, that kind of relates to that catch twenty two. Um, and, uh, you know, I would say that, uh, my path is, is pretty typical in that I had to find somebody that knew somebody that would get me kind of past that barrier. Um, is, is that the most prevalent way to get around that catch 22? You know, that certainly is one, uh, method to utilize. Uh, the other method is, is to get creative. You know, um, a marketing, a sales, a business development person doesn't take the first no. They just keep going, going, going until they hear several no's before they really get it that it's a no. And it's the same thing with job hunting. You know, I sort of liken job hunting to, uh, the video game, uh, Pac-Man. You're gonna get no, 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 yes. <laughs> but if you're not getting right. the no's, you're never gonna get to the yes. And I understand how defeating it is to hear a no, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, you gotta get used to that, you know, gotta get used to that experience. So you're just playing Pac-Man when you, when you job hunt. So, you know, these days I just tell people create your own experience. You know, uh, we've got the internet, you know, it's been around for a while. There's plenty of companies out there who need beta testers. There are plenty of companies out there who are working on projects. Uh, and they invite people from, from outside of the industry to come in and, you know, contribute art assets or contribute some code. Um, you know, uh, uh, there is uh, the game jams, you know, that uh, the International Game Developers Association puts on, uh, Casual Connect, you know, there's, uh, you know, there's even some independent game development projects that are on the internet that, that happen every month, every three months, those kinds of things. So it's just about getting smart, finding those resources, and getting the experience. Because, of course, if you volunteer yourself and you work on a, on a, on a mod or uh, on a game that gets released, that's experience, and that, ca- and that experience counts. That's true. So that's so, a great way. That's a great way to start to get game industry exposure. So, um, I, I know that you can speak directly to this. Um, can't recruiters help you get past that twenty-two barrier, catch twenty-two barrier? 
No, uh, because you either have the experience or you don't. Uh, you know, that's the first thing. And the second thing is, you know, a company is going to pay a recruiter. If they're going to pay a fee to, to hire somebody, they want someone who's got experience. They're not going to pay a fee for someone who's just graduating from college or someone transitioning into the industry. They're already taking a risk with a new a newbie, quote unquote, you know, to then pay a ten or twenty thousand dollar fee, forget it. Just doesn't happen. So um, I tell anyone who's new to the industry or transitioning in, absolutely no way should you ever give your resume to a recruiter. And if a recruiter <laughs> asks your resume knowing that you're a new a recent graduate or that you're transitioning in, that's the recruiter I put on my blacklist that I will never speak to again because they're quite selfish and they really don't care about you as a candidate or as a job hunter. You know, they just care about them making a deal. You know, if you come to the business, you know, just to do deals, that's not that's not a good recruiter. Go find someone who's who's got a passion for the industry and really wants to help people because uh, that's, you know, that's where you can get the best bang for your buck. But, yeah, for entry-level folks, recruiters will actually lock them out of the industry. Um, and a lot of people say to me, what do you mean lock me out of the industry? Well, you know, my, my contract, the standard contract in the industry is if I have a deal with EA or Ubisoft or Microsoft or whoever I'm, whoever I'm uh, staffing, uh, the candidates that I submit to that company are, are owned by me for 12 months. So January 1st, if I send that resume in, it's not till 2016, next year, that you can approach Microsoft. Well, you can approach Microsoft and give them a resume, at, but you, there's a fee in your head. Then there's a fee you have for 12 months. So I really encourage folks who are new to the industry to be very careful about who they give their resume to, um, even the online job boards. I don't like full resumes being posted, and I think people are crazy to do so. I think it's uh, great to do a summary of your skills, get people interested to, to connect with you, but to provide your resume on Monster or something like that, uh, sorry, recruiters who are unscrupulous can, you know, they pay for these online, you know, job boards too, and they can just take your resume and then submit you all over the planet. And that just locks you out of every job. So I tell people to be extremely careful with their resume, where they post it online, and who they give it to, because once you give it out to the wrong person, you've lost control. And the last thing you want is one resume being sent to 500 companies, because a generic resume is never going to get you a job. A resume needs to be customized. Sure, you can have your own resume in a generic form that is customizable, but you can't send out one resume to everyone. You need to customize that to EA, to Ubisoft, to all these other companies because they have slightly different market penetrations and market focuses. So, of course, the resume has to be slightly different. Right. Well, wow. That I mean, it just feels so counterintuitive that, that you know, somebody that has all of these uh, gaming connections wouldn't be the, the people that you would reach out to immediately um, in order to try to break into the industry. But you, you outline it in an excellent way in that, you know, People are, everybody's trying to make a buck. And, uh, you know, you have to be careful with how you use your information because you can actually be hurting your job search in the long run. Yeah. Recruiter is great if you've got at least two games on the market that are professionally being sold. So they're on the App Store, you know, they're in the retail outlets. You know, it's a real game being sold on the market. It's an online downloadable game. Great. You know, uh, yeah, after that, you go to a recruiter after you've got two titles, uh, you know, under your belt. A recruiter will rock your world. A good recruiter, you know. <laughs> but I say, hey, you don't hire the first surgeon. You certainly don't hire the first recruiter you meet. You interview those people, and if they don't know the industry, they can't talk the talk, they won't give you names, they won't engage, that's exactly how they're going to represent you in the industry. I don't want to be represented that way. I want to be represented by someone who knows games, knows how to sell me, and knows how to and has access to those hiring managers. So you gotta you gotta qualify, you know, the recruiter. You know, I encourage people to do that all the time. Right, right. So in the gaming industry, are there particular vocations that are less prone to the catch twenty two problem? You know, quality assurance. You know, game testers, mm -hmm. uh, that is, you know, an awesome way to get into a game company. It has been that way for many years and will continue to be so. Uh, because when you think about it, uh, you know, we tend to hire younger folks in the QA department. Mm -hmm. um, and every executive is walking through QA. Why? Because when I'm a vice president, I'm about 35, 40, 45, yet I'm making games for the boys market, you know, Whatever, whatever, you know, or the youth market or the girls market, well, guess what? I'm a 45-year-old guy or I'm a 50-year-old guy. How am I making games for that market? So that's why the executives are always walking through the QA departments, and that is key. 
You know what I mean? So you get yourself in the door. You've got art skills. You're not really into QA. All right, great. When that art manager is walking through the, the QA department, you show the art manager your demo reel. Done. Yeah. You got the job. Absolutely. If people like to hire who they know, you know what I mean? So once they've met you, seen the white of your eyes, you know, and that human connection has been made, they're going to hire you over any over a resume that's been thrown to them on the Internet. You know what I'm saying? So that's why, that's why QA is so great because you get the face-to-face time, you get exposure to a game, you get to network with people, you get to meet them, you know, you get to get the feel for what the company is like. Um, it's a, just a great way to, uh, to, to walk yourself into the game industry, and it's a lower barrier of entry. Some of those jobs you can get by calling the HR department at your target company. Uh, a lot of companies, uh, once or twice a year, will bring on 50 to 200 uh, testers. Uh, they use a temp agency, so call HR, you know, at EA or at, uh, at Activision. Hey, who's your temp agency that you use for QA? They'll tell you. Send your resume into the temp agency and make sure you list games in that resume. <laughs> make sure that resume is obviously a game resume because otherwise you're not going to get a game job. You know, but, uh, you know, um, and that's bam, and you're in the door. Eight, you know, twelve, you know, eighteen dollars, twenty dollars an hour depends on what type of job you get in the QA department. So you're right. getting paid for it, and uh, and it gives you the opportunity to pitch yourself to uh, to the execs that are walking through the studio, you know, right. department. Right, yeah. right. And I can I can speak a little bit uh, to this from my personal experience. Um, another way to really sh- uh, stand out in a QA department is to take the profession seriously. Um, because a, a, one of the big reasons to uh, hire a bunch of people to do a bunch of play testing is you're looking for a certain set of uh, quality assurance experience, um, but with the expectation that the uh, game's going to ship soon and then those people are going to be let go and kind of move on to the next opportunity. If you come with your with your A game and really let the executives that are walking through the department know that you're serious about making a career in the profession and uh, show up on time, um, and uh, have some some assets, some some portfolio things that are ready to go. If you start uh, talking to people about areas that you want to learn in other departments, I, I really have to say that that is not often the mentality of people that are starting off at the entry level QA. That you will have an opportunity to really uh, stand out. Yeah, you know. I know. I, I you know. I think that uh, a lot of us are used to the instant oatmeal, the easy fix. Um, and we expect that job, you know, jobs and job hunting are going to fall in that category, and they just don't, you know. And it just disappoints me so much. It's so frustrating to see someone who has spent lots of money to get a degree um, and clearly a lot of effort, and then they don't put that amount of effort or time into their job search. Doesn't even make sense to me, you know. So I mean, uh, how many people, you know, go through college? And then they graduate and they've got one more month left of money and they've got to find a job. Well, that's why they're flipping burgers at McDonald's. I mean, <laughs> you know, it makes sense to me that, you know, you, you need to spend some time. It takes sometimes a job search. You know, it used to be, uh, gosh, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, the formula used to be for every $1,000, uh, it took a month. Mm-hmm. You know, or, or every ten thousand dollars, it took a month. Yeah, yeah. So if you're looking for a fifty thousand dollar job, that's five months to find that job. You right. know, and I, it sort of still can be the same way. It really can, especially the first job hunt. The first job hunt's murder, and they oh, really yeah. should do a better job at preparing us in college or in our in, a, in our training for that first job hunt. Because the first job hunt is the worst. You'll never experience a job hunt like that that, that again, uh, you know. But uh, you know, they really should uh, really should uh, give people a little bit more support in that in that area because I can get it. It's definitely emotional time, you know, to, you, you, when you're when you're job hunting for the first time. Right, and you know, I I come from an educational space as well, and uh, you know, this is a tangent that will you know I could talk about for days. Uh, you know, and that's part of the the reason for the Gaming Careers podcast because there is a gap between um, book knowledge and a degree, and how do you actually make this happen? And this, I think, uh, our listeners are familiar at this point if they've listened up to this point that the stories that are being shared by the professionals in the industry is very, very different from you know what they will potentially teach you in in the classroom. So there's this whole rubber meets the road experience that uh, you know I don't think we we do a good job at all uh, with most degrees to uh, help our graduates get work. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, and go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, I was, I was just saying you know even the colleges that I'm on the advisory board, you know that's a big thing I try to push is let, let's have a 
job hunting, a resume writing, a, you know, you know, course, you know, so that we can teach people how to actually do this because it's a process. You know, you need to learn how to organize your resume, organize your LinkedIn profile. There's an art and science to, to putting together a LinkedIn profile. Who knew? LinkedIn wasn't even around five years ago or eight years ago, whatever it was. Right. But we didn't even think about it for job hunting. Now it's a it's a pretty important it's a pretty important tool, you know, to have in your uh, in your in your shed. And of course, you know, there are tricks to uh, putting that that profile together so it's noticed. You know, so yeah, so there's a lot of uh, little tricks and things. And I think that uh, it would be awesome to have a class on that. Uh, that's why I'm writing a series this year on how to organize and deploy your game industry job search. You know, so that I can go through all the steps. The resume, the emails, you know, the da- how to organize a database, how to research the people you're going to approach, the whole thing. You know what I mean? So I'm going to be putting that together this year and publishing uh, small articles off of uh, the main topic uh, throughout the year. Really? Well, I, I hope that you'll uh, consider coming back on the show and talking about that when it's ready. Yeah, totally, totally. All right. So uh, sticking with the subject of that catch-22 into getting into the gaming industry, uh, I have kind of a, a general five-point list um, of things that you can potentially do to get past that catch-22. Uh, I'd like to go through them kind of um, from least to most effective, in my opinion, and, and get your thoughts on it, as well as some specific examples from the recruiter standpoint that uh, might be able to help out our listeners transition into their first studio job. Okay. Sure. So the first one is get a degree in gaming. So I've heard a lot of mixed reviews about this, uh, and I've done some hiring myself. Um, it slows me down if somebody has a degree in gaming and makes me linger a little bit longer on the resume for consideration. Can you talk about the effectiveness of getting a, a, a degree in game design and uh, you know how that might uh, help somebody out? Yeah, you know, it's just a mixed bag out there with hiring managers and how they feel about uh, programs, uh, degree programs that specialize in gaming. So, you know, it's, if you're going to do the route of a, of a gaming degree, you know, you just need to ensure that the college you're going to is truly teaching you the, the, cur- the correct software, the correct engines, uh, you know, that you're walking away with a good demo so that you can job hunt. You know, that's the purpose of going to a program like that. Otherwise, go get a general degree uh, and go to a school that's recognized so that people can say, yes, okay, that's a degree from Carnegie Mellon. I get it. You know, that's a degree from MIT. Got it. You know, you know what I'm saying? So, right. you know, there's no question when someone has a degree like that. So it's fine to get a general degree, but then what you miss in those programs, you know, is, is you miss the game-specific terminology, the game-specific technical or or creative issues that we that we get bogged down into, you know. So, um, you know, so there's, there's pros and cons to both. Uh, but... Uh, Generally, if it's a well-known school, a uh, recognizable school of some sort, then that's uh, a- any type of education, any type of training you do is going to qualify you for a job. You know, the net-net is it comes down to the demo. What can you implement, <laughs> uh-huh. period? And you- that is, show me the money, baby. That's what it is. That's right. You know? I'm going to pause that one because that's going to be my next to the, the last one, but I, I do want to revisit that subject. <laughs> Uh, do you have any um, awareness of any bias in the industry around uh, for-profit colleges versus what you were saying, the, the more general, maybe a computer science degree from a more notable university? You know, yeah, I mean, I've heard some bias about it, but then, of course, when I talk to the hiring managers, because when I'm representing someone, I'm certainly not going to take a no because of their degree. Give me a break. Sure. So, uh, you know, when I do challenge the hiring manager about their assumption about a particular school, uh, but, but of course, that causes me to have to go research the school to then go sell my candidate. Uh, right. But I do it because I need to be able to answer that question. Well, it's not a college I know, and what's this game degree? What does it you know? What does it mean? So I'm always right there with my hiring manager saying, "Hey, this degree is pretty decent. Look at it. You know what I mean? A right. 900 hours of C plus plus. Who teaches that? You know what I mean? So sure. you know, so I figure out what the the bonuses are of the program, and I actually encourage people uh, if they don't have someone representing them, put it in the resume. What is so cool about the program that you got the degree you got you know right. why, is it, why is it different why did you choose a school what does that degree stand out over a degree from another college you know uh and tell people that you know and there are reasons why some schools are better you know so put it in writing let people know why your degree rocks you know yeah, and, I think and uh, some of the colleges good. really can boast about it you know yeah, and, and writing, this is what I really like about what you just said, the writing about what's cool about your degree program for somebody that might miss it otherwise. Um, you know, I try to stay pretty 
even handed about how I treat all options that are out there because different strokes for different po- uh, folks. That's, you know, what's going to be your success in gaming. Uh, I have uh, a degree from a for profit college and the experience that I had there produced, I would, uh, I would say a better real life set of experiences than, um, a lot of theory. And, uh, you know, it has absolutely been critical to my success in my career. Now, I know that that's not the same experience for everybody when you read the boards about uh, for-profit colleges. So it's one of those things. Say why it's cool. Point out how this uh, degree program really strengthened your skills in this particular area. And I know we're, we're foreshadowing to something that you've said before. Make sure that those things that you've just talked about are sh- show up in your portfolio. So, yes. So the the next thing uh, is to just get your foot in the door. And we talked a little bit about this. Apply to jobs that relate to the profession that you're trying to get that are related. And so in this case, uh, quality assurance and maybe customer service, uh, you know, a, a support uh, role in uh, in an industry, in the, the gaming industry. Can you think of any other entry-level jobs that uh, will lead to other things that you've seen often in uh you know, uh, I've seen uh, people, uh, community manager jobs are a great way to walk in the door. So, of course, uh, to be a community manager, you have to be an MMO player. All right. Well, most people are not going to want to make MMO games unless they play MMO games. So there you go. You know what I mean? It's kind of, right. you know, mo- most, mo- most people who are interested in, that mar- in a market segment play the games or, or use the products. So, um, so there you go. So that's another way right in the door that's great. Uh, analytics, uh, if you're in the, onto the business side of things, you can teach yourself Google and, uh, some of these other analytics software products, how to read the, pro- how to read analytics. You can go out there and start to review games. I met a candidate, uh, she's really young in her career, blows me away. She just, uh, created a site on the internet, you know, her own little blog. She has got millions of followers at this point. I mean, she's been in the industry. She's not even, I mean, okay, you can consider her in the industry for three years. So three years ago, she started a blog reviewing games. And wow, you know, she's got three years of experience reviewing games, reviewing games, reviewing games, and this huge audience. So when I go to sell her now to for a job, are you kidding me? It sells itself. She's wow. got an audience. So any community manager job, any kind of job that, uh, that with, a, with game design flavor, any of that stuff, she's proven herself already, and she's got an audience. You know, so, you know, it's a very, you know, it's an interesting thing of that stepping out of the box. This is someone who is clever enough to think about, okay, how can I create the experience for myself? And she did it. So, you know, there's many options out there. I bumped into a, a guy who's like you, you know, and he's not doing podcasts, but he's doing uh, video casts. You know, so he right. does segments on games. You know, get to any conference he can get to, interview people, do whatever he can do. He's been on the Internet for a few years now. He started off when he was 16 years old, so now he's a whole 20, 21 years old, so he's actually now employable. Right. But since 16, he's created enough of a, of a resume and a background for himself that he can go sell himself to any game company's marketing department. Are you kidding me? Of right. course he can. You know, so it's it's about that. It's about getting creative. What can I do today? May not be exactly what I want to do, but it'll but but you know it'll it'll be the it'll be the underpinnings to getting to get me where I want to go. You know, yeah, so I, I yeah. Gotta, so I think. Go ahead. No, I, I was uh, I was done. Okay, so I you know I get excited about the uh, the the platform development that's uh, available to us today, and really how that relates to building a career is we are all essentially self-employed, and what I mean by that is we're responsible for developing our own skills and providing value to the market. That then whatever studio that we work with um, is is there to partner with me to produce something cool. So I bring skills to the table, they bring money to the table, and hopefully we create something together. So, um, Exactly. Because that's a degree that you're getting from a college is just a foundation. You've got to build on that foundation. They're just teaching you 101 Maya, you know what I mean? Right. Or 101 C++ programming. You need to take that now and make a game. And you need to, you know, you take, take your Maya skills and... You know, do character art, do whatever you're going to do. You know, you know what I'm saying? You've got to implement. So, uh, so yeah. So, uh, I don't think the degree is so important as much as what you do with the degree once you've got it. You know, what have you done with the experience you've learned? Right, right. And so, 
Uh, that leads in really well into the next subject. This is the uh, third um, thing to get past that catch-22, which is to get social. Uh, and that has to do with uh, social networking and also hanging out with gamers that are in the industry. So from your perspective, are there um, kind of these social hubs that people can start reaching out to um, to interact with game professionals and get their name out there? Oh, yeah. You know, the International Game Developers Association is a wonderful vehicle for that. Uh, the meetup groups all across the country, another wonderful vehicle. Almost every college, if they've got some sort of gaming program, will have a game club. All right, so you're not part of the college. The game club doesn't meet during the day. It's usually at the end of the day or early evening so that, right. so that people who are not at the college or alumni of the college can show up to the game, the game group or the game club. So all of these avenues get you socializing with like-kind people, get you exposed to the terminology, to the industry, to the, to the work environment, you know, and it just, uh, you know, it just makes uh, the next step from, from networking and socializing much easier. That's an excellent point because um – Proactive studios uh, will reach out to those types of organizations at colleges and build those kind of informal networks to, uh, as a feeder program to their studios, right? Of course. Of course. And, of course, you know, well, these groups are online. You know what I mean? So, you know, you know, any of the colleges, I mean, even here in Florida, I mean, Broward Community College has got a, has got a game club. And the game club is online. So, you know, so you can get to these people easily, network with them, you know, they'll get jobs and they'll move into games and then guess what? Now you know someone who works at a game company. You know, right. you know what I'm saying? So it's a great way to, to network and to get yourself known and to teach yourself how to network. Because, you know, if you go to a local meeting and you blow it the first one or two times, all right, big deal. No, no big deal. You know, you can always, you can always try again with another group. So, because practice makes perfect. And that's been the big thing for a lot of people, especially for programmers who are not uh, particularly social, is that they they're scared to death to network and to socialize, you know, and I just think, you know, and that's, that's the important thing. And I spend a lot of time teaching people how to network in a room, how to work the room, because, of course, that's what you want to do when you're at a conference, not drink. I mean, forget it. That's the last thing I'm doing is drinking at a conference. I'm networking. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> So, and also getting to the conferences like Game Developers, you know, Casual Connect, you know, Dice, whatever that is, depending on what you want to be or are in the industry, you know, going to those events are paramount. You know, you get to see what's coming down the pike and you get to meet people. They're in the elevator. They're eating at the restaurants. They're all over the place. You go to Game Developers, that's 10,000 people, you know, in three block radius in downtown San Francisco. Almost anyone on the street, in the, in the hallways, almost anyone you bump into for that week, uh, that almost two weeks is a gamer. I right. mean, stay, if you, if you don't like being in the hall, stay in the hall, stay in the hotel, stay in the, in the elevators, go up and down the elevator all day long, talk to the people in the elevator. You know what I mean? Sure. Sure. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. really that easy. You know, but, uh, you know, you just gotta get over the fear of networking and talking to folks. And, and so those groups are really a great way to start. Yeah, and uh, that's what I had, so we're, uh, great to have a five bullet point list, but it kind of all blends together. So that Get Social, I was talking more about, you know, social networks and hanging out informally. One of my favorite things is to, uh, you know, if it, you have studios in your area, those people are gamers, so they're going to want to play games. Find out where they play games and hang out with them. Uh, that was, yeah, a lot of companies have game nights where all their, I mean, you know, they don't advertise it, but all their employees are on a game. It could be an MMO, it can be whatever, and they all jump on and they all play together. So they have the experience of socializing and interacting with each other, even though it's through a game. Um, so, of course, join that, join that, find out when Activision does that, find out when these other companies are doing it, and, you know, and join the game at that time and get on the guild. If you, I mean, get, get involved, you know, with an MMO or whatever, so that people start to realize, oh, wow, this person plays game. What's this person saying? You know what I mean? And it just starts from there. You know? Right, and you know that's my pro tip for this uh, this episode. That's how I broke into the industry. It was uh, it wasn't through a super well written resume. I'm sorry to say, um, it was by hanging out with gamers. And then this one guy said, "Hey, man, you're kind of cool," and said, "Hey, you're kind of cool too." And what do you do for a living? Oh, I work at this place. And uh, you know, the next time one of those mass hiring came for a QA, I got I got a call. Hey, man, you would love to check this out. And that's that's what did it. So it really was. Ah, that. so you're a QA baby. Too. <laughs> I'm a QA baby, and that's why I point out uh, show up with your A game because 
I don't have, I didn't have QA uh, background. I didn't have a tech background, but I did have a business background. So when I showed up on, on uh, site, I was there to do work and I was there to put reports in and I was there to increase efficiencies. And, you know, I, I didn't know that that wasn't generally the mindset. So that uh, kind of led me into getting promoted twice within the same year and, uh, you know, ending up with uh, uh, a QA lead credit for uh, our our game when it came out. So it was it was really that level of professionalism that skyrocketed the uh, my opportunity. And I know that that same potential exists for uh, other people that would hit the ga- uh, the ground running at a studio. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So That's awesome. Yeah. The, and so I do want to touch again a little bit about the those professional organizations. Um, those professional organizations where people are there to do industry stuff. That is just a place to be to just soak up everything like a sponge. Uh, you'll have great presentations. Uh, you'll be able to take lots of notes. And really, what you just said, that networking of being in the room, letting other people see your face and your interest, uh, I think that that's kind of like one step higher than social in that you are showing your interest on a professional level about developing professional skills. And that that, that little separation, I think, is really important to uh, make you stand out in that uh, you want to build professional skills, not that you just want to sit around and, and make games and be a fanboy uh, all day long. And, you know, and even if you're in uh, nowhere USA and there's not even, and there's no local IGDA chapter, establish the IGDA chapter yourself. Oh, even if you only get five idea. people that show, that show up to the meeting every, every month, fine. But what that does is that when you go to the game developer conference and you get access to, to the International Game Developer Association because you are a, uh, you know, you're running one of their groups, you know, so guess what? You get access to some of the, uh, to some of, uh, of the game developer conference that most people don't get access to because of course GDC is quite active there. I mean, right. uh, you know, IGDA is quite active there. And also, you know, the industry icons, Trip Hawk, John Romero, all these famous people in our industry, they want to give back. They're gamers, too. And oh, in, yeah. at the end of the day, they're gamers. They love what I love to do, which is get people into the industry. So they're volunteering their time. Graham Devine, all these people, they're volunteering their time, and they're involved with IGDA. So that when you go to the main conferences, even if you're from no, nowhere USA, you get in the door and you get to meet these folks. And through that experience, you'll get to network and open up your world, you know, so so it's really, you know, it's really about just creating your own experiences. Yeah, and uh, man, this is just so exciting. Uh, so for anybody that thinks that they're in Nowhere USA, you now have this uh, I, I, everything short of a silver bullet, right? So go out and create, be the founder of one of these groups in your area and start building the community around yourself, and that really will unlock doors for you to get access to these other people that you would never have otherwise because you are helping further the mission. So I don't know. I I just think that that is uh, incredible advice for somebody that I think overcomes the objection that I don't have access to studios in my area or, you know, I don't have the type of resources. There really is that opportunity. Get online use these social networks and uh, create one for yourself. Yeah, you know, and I have companies that are virtual, you know, so they're game companies, and the CTO is in Germany, and the development programmers in San Francisco, and other ones in, you know, in Austin, and other ones in in Miami, uh, you know, so they're all, they're distributed all over the country, all over the world, and yet they're still all making a game together. So, you know, it is 2015. <laughs> right. You know, technology is here. It can be done. So I don't care where you are in the world, you know, as long as you have a decent Internet connection, you know, there's just really no excuse. Uh, and there's really – and there are companies that will hire you to work from your home even. You know, you Absolutely. just got to find them. You know, they're not as easy to locate as, uh, you know, as a huge corporation is, you know, who's advertising constantly. But uh, they're out there, you know. Absolutely. And so this last one, I, I really want to kind of call the crowning achievement for the overcoming the catch 22 is building your portfolio. So uh, I know you mentioned it a little bit before, but can we talk about what might be contained within that portfolio for several of the different common uh, entries into the into the industry? Yeah, a portfolio is the most important thing and required in the video game industry for every job you can think of. Yes, Everything. marketing people. Yes, producers. Hello, wake up. That's exactly what they do. And I, got, I can tell you there are producers out there who've got 
gorgeous online demos, you know, and they really demonstrate, you know, who and what they are. The important thing about a demo is that it needs to be easy to get to. It needs to clearly communicate what you do in a quick fashion. You know, we live in a culture. We're used to looking at information quickly and making a yes-no decision if we're going to continue or not. So your website, your demo, first of all, it's got to be online. There's no way that you can force people to download assets, download an engine, oh, yeah. download art. Forget it. No, 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 no. You've got to figure out how to get that live on the internet. You know what I mean? No one's going to take a no one's going to take a CD anymore and put it in their computer. There's too many too much risk of virus. You know what right. I mean? So you know you can't save the file as uh, you know 3D Studio Max uh, from 10 years ago and think that a game company is going to have that. Or you can't use the the brand the most brand new version of Max and assume that people have that as well. So, you know, you've got to figure out through YouTube or other clever ways, you know, making uh, small, you know, small videos or movies. Um, you've got to figure out a way to, to show your stuff. It's got to capture someone's attention immediately um, and, you know, draw them in to look at the site. So don't make it difficult to get to the juice of what you are and what you bring to the table. It should be there the minute I open the website. You know, you need to, to bait people to continue to stay on your site. So, again, just like your LinkedIn profile, I think the online de- your demo is, uh, is also something that has some, you know, creativity to it, and it also has uh, – there's some rules of engagement, you know, that you want to keep in mind. So you want people to have a good, fun experience quickly and not have to struggle to get to where is his 3D models, where are the, the, the wireframes, where are the, you know, where's the code, you know, that kind of stuff. You just can't make it, make it an issue. You know, it's got to be very accessible. Right. And I will speak to this from a a hiring standpoint. Think of it from your hiring manager's perspective as far as the user experience of working with your material. So you've just presented this wonderful resume and uh, somewhere on the link it says click to my whatever for your portfolio. You click on the link and guess what? We always, always click on the link. Okay. We learn more about it from the link than we do the resume. We do. Every time. And we research you on the internet too. <laughs> yes, it's, oh my gosh. So clean up your social networks. Okay. So, but anyway. Clean it up and lock it down. Like oh Facebook, lock down that Facebook. <laughs> All right. So let me, you know, let me digress on a brief example here. You have a wonderful resume, well written, uh, and it's, uh, articulate. It's well designed. It's pleasing to the eye. Here's my, um, my demo packet. I click on it, my portfolio, and a big old huge bright screen shows up um, with uh, you know purple text and blink text all over the place. Guess what? I'm done. I don't care. I don't, at that point, I'm, I don't want to know anything more about you, okay? Because you've just ruined my user experience from a nice front and bad contents within. So think of the entire package uh, from yes. the, the eyes of a, of a manager. Even the music. I can't tell you how many demos I've seen with heavy metal music. What is up with the heavy metal music? Do you think a 40-year-old art director wants to listen to heavy metal music when they're looking at your demo? Absolutely (laughs) not. And guess what? They'll jump off the demo because the music is that annoying, even if your art skill is good. So I've heard that from a lot of managers. In fact, just the other day, uh, the CEO of one of one of my clients, he called me up and he goes, Mark, not only did I love the resume, not only did I love the demo, I love the music on the guy's demo. You need to tell him <laughs> how much I enjoyed the entire experience. And you know what? When I looked at that, uh, you know, I had to go back on, this, you know, on his site. When I looked at it, I realized, you know, clever, this was a clever artist. And, uh, he just, and he even picked music that not only mood fit his art, but it was in the genre, it was in the, you know, the, he, he realized that on the other end, you know, most likely the manager is going to be 35, 40, 45 years old. He sure. played music that a 30, 35, 40 year old would, was used to hearing. You know what I mean? Not right, something right. from today that they might not be listening to. Not something from 40 years ago. You know, not some fringe type of music. And it just drew him in and he was, a, I mean, they flew him in in a day. I swear wow. to God, I hung the phone up. 24 hours later, he was, he's, he's in Miami interviewing for the, with the company. I'm sure tonight when I'm done with you, he'll have the job. I mean, it was that, <laughs> that amazing of experience. So, yeah. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. And, and on so the, you really got to think about that demo from all aspects. You absolutely do. And, you know, on one hand, I've heard people say, well, you know, it's my opportunity to, to show my creativity and all of, uh, yes. all of the things that I have to bring to the table. And that's true. But it's not your opportunity to show your creativity that you can do things that, uh, that are weird and, 
don't relate to what your studio wants, right? So it's how you're creating. Yeah, it's not like a personal blog or like what Facebook is. You, you know what I'm saying? Right. It's, it's, yes, you're creative, but you've got to be creative in a way that is a pro, it's sellable in the industry. It, into, it's the mass market. You know, you've got, you know, you can't be, you know, in fact, fr- frankly, I tell people have two Facebooks. You know, use your first name and your middle name as your private Facebook and your first name and your last name as your business Facebook. You know, ah. swear to God, you know, that's what I, I tell a lot of people do that. And, you know, because really, you know, like my nephew, since his eyes opened, the Internet's been around and so is Facebook. So he <laughs> is every hour posting on Facebook. So do you think when he goes to job hunt, I mean, he's just now, you know, this is like second year before he graduates uh, high school. But you know what? But it's all there. I mean, I can right. go back to 10 years and see the stupid postings he did with his with his friends in elementary school. Wow. No, you know what I mean? You don't want an employer to see that, you right. know? So, right. yeah, so I'm really, I, I encourage people to have two different accounts. One's personal, one's private. You know, one's business, one's uh, personal. And, and then maybe you can be creative and do all the crazy things you want to do and talk about whatever. And But on the, on the one that you're going to be doing for business, you know, keep it to uh, safe topics, keep it mass market, you know, don't put anything up that uh, you wouldn't want your parents to see right. <laughs> or read. <laughs> it's a good rule of thumb. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, you know, I had, a, I had someone once just from their Facebook. I mean, they had the job, and just before they made the offer, they looked at the Facebook page, and there was all these pictures of this candidate drinking. Uh, you know, it was a female candidate, and all these pictures of the candidate drinking with, lots of, with guys. Right. Now, when you think about it, it was her goodbye party from, from, the, from the old job, and uh-huh. video game industry is, is pretty heavy male-oriented, so it was totally innocent. But the company's HR department interpreted that differently. They interpreted right. that as, gee, is this someone who has an alcohol problem? And they didn't, get, they didn't extend the offer solely based on her social profile. So, right. yeah, so people got to be careful with that. Now, and I've heard a lot of people get frustrated with that or say it's not fair and, you know, well, that's not who I'm really about. And, you know, guess what? It's it's not fair. Um, but, you know, when I'm looking at... Life isn't fair. Life isn't fair. When I'm looking at 50 resumes in an hour, right... I'm I'm getting a general impression. Do you fit my general mold that I'm looking for? And then I'm looking for reasons to move on to the next one. And so that's exactly. not fair. And it's but it's it's the implicit things. Where is the line type settings? How does that look? If I click on your link, do I get uh, you know black background with purple text? I'm just moving on, right? I'm going to check you out. Yeah, the layout the is important. The yeah. layout of the resume and the, and the demo is important. If it's not laid out in a in a in an organized way, they're going to think that you're scatterbrained. So if you can't figure out how to present yourself in a one page resume or a two page resume, how what the hell's your game design document going to look like? What what right. are your business reports going to look like? You know what I mean? So people really take a look at the the demo, the resume, the layout, the structure, all of it. All nothing goes unnoticed. You really need to pay attention uh, because all that information is being taken in because they're trying to assess you over somebody else. You know, so yeah, right. and sometimes it's just not fair. You and, know? you know, yeah. this is a, a brief digression about, you know, resumes, but if you don't have a lot of experience, don't pretend like you have a lot of experience. Um, I have offered um, follow-up interviews to people that said, I'm still in school, I don't have any gaming experience, or I don't have any professional experience. These are my strongest attributes that I've I, that I've identified. These are the things that I'm working on. This is what I'm passionate about. But they spent the time to do the formatting of the resume in such a way that I could see that they had done it with care and intention, and they got a follow-up call. Right. All right. So, so you can you see you see even in yourself how you're making judgments and analyzing you know the data you get to decide if you're going to move forward. So yeah, it's the same thing. Absolutely. It's awesome. So yeah. as I, I want to wrap up the portfolio, that's our our last topic to discuss, uh, and we're, we're just about done with it. I have heard some people say that the things that are in your portfolio have to be completely done by you. In other words, you can't get a group of four or five people together and produce this thing and then put that as part of your portfolio. Can you speak to that? Yeah and yes. Yeah and no. I mean, clearly, if you do one senior pro- – you know, we had this, uh, you know, uh, early on, I remember, with the Art Institute, you know, there'd be 15 students working on the final, you know, art presentation. Uh, someone did the skinning. Someone did the animation. Someone did the – you know, everyone took a different piece, and yet – 
you know, the art ma- the hiring manager on the other on the other side saw 15 different people show the same thing, saying that they did it. So I can understand, right. you know, what you're saying, you know. But but you know, you certainly can show, you know, parts of work, and but be clear on what you did. I only right. did the skinning. You know, I only, I did the wireframes, you know, and that's what's important. So it's not really about, it has to be all 100% your stuff, but you just have to be very clear what yours is and what you're not taking claim to. So, you know, a big uh, one thing that happened years ago was, you know, you know, there's all these wireframes on the internet. So, of course, you know, come on, you know, we're not all expert at that. Download a wireframe, you know, build on top of it, done. But don't take credit for that wireframe. Right. Let people know, and because if, if you found it, guess what? The art director found it, That's and we're right. in the high tech business. We all know about it, so don't just go. You know, don't try to claim. Don't don't try to claim that with stuff that you didn't do. Yeah, so that that's just it. So uh, and be clear where on what your contributions were, and that so that this way I'm not struggling and you're not struggling when we're looking at the demo about what is it that this person did. Right, so, and because yeah, it is frustrating to see the same image five times, five p- different people claiming it. Like, how many people claim to be the game designer of XYZ game? You know, after a while, you're like, and sometimes the company's so large, there were five or seven game designers on the game. But sure. come on, one's doing system design, one's doing level layout, one's doing, they're not really doing the entire game. To, you know, you know, it's, it's sometimes it can be difficult to figure out really who did what. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But you want to be clear about that. Yeah. Right, and, you know, as... As the final note in in the uh, portfolio, whatever profession that you are applying to, there is a portfolio component. So figure out what that is, and I'll suggest that that puts you above 90% of the other applicants that, uh, applicants that are out there. And yes, I mean QA has a portfolio aspect as well. So write five bugs and give and put that on a website with a, a small video clip of the bug that you've observed with your write up of the bug. And guess what? That's uh, nine out of ten people go. haven't done that. You've just got exactly. You got the back. QA job. You, you got just got the job. Yeah, or you got the callback at least. Exactly right. Exactly That's right. Exactly what you got to do. You got it. Mark, this has been amazing. I think we've definitely nailed the catch-22 problem and really outlined some ways to get past it in a very concrete way. So this has been an incredible hour to talk with you, and I really appreciate your time to share your experience. I always enjoyed Stephen, and it's always great to uh, share my knowledge so that other people can get into the game, um, because that's uh, what it's all about, you know, is uh, sharing the love and, uh, you know, having people uh, join our industry. All right. So if people want to follow up and read more about what uh, you have to offer, where can they find that information? You know, a lot of my stuff is on GameRecruiter.com. Um, I also have uh, my own blog uh, site, and uh, gosh, I should know the name of it. It's Mark Mentor Blog spot something like that dot com. I'm sure you can just Google it, you know, it comes up. You know, and the last thing I want to leave people with, you know, uh you know, demos, resume, all that kind of stuff. I don't know about you, but I've had the same phone number, the same email address, and the same website for the past thirty five years. And if you don't do that, you're insane. <laughs> you can do it. You know what I'm saying? Someone should be able to find you five years from now, seven years from now, ten years from now without any struggle or issue. So I tell everyone that I meet, please get a permanent address and use that address for the rest of your life. So you want to be careful about what names you use. You know, you don't want to be too crazy, you know, and then when you're 50 years old, you don't like it. You know what I mean? So, you know, pick some stuff that's professional and nail it down and own that phone number, own that website, own that email address so that, Anyone can find you all the time. That's a really the most critical part of it all. And with that, we will talk to you next time. This has been amazing, and I'm looking forward to having, back, having you back on the show. All right. Thanks so much, Stephen. You've been listening to another edition of the Gaming Careers Podcast. You can find the show notes for today's episode at thecompanybar.com slash podcast. There you can find bullet-pointed notes from the show, links to resources discussed, as well as the extended interview that has even more great content for you that didn't make it into the episode today. That's it for this week. I'll see you next time.